Jason met derivation with one thing. We wanted to get rid of the forces of constraint. And in fact, we wanted to get rid also of any place within our time within the equation of motion. We wanted to eliminate that. And uh, to do this, we took Newton's law. Newton's law is a very accurate description of the classical universe, but it had serious shortcomings. And the serious shortcomings were when we write it like this, in this mathematical clothing, it does not allow us to ignore the force of constraint, and it is not transformation invariant. These things led us upon a rather whistle stop tour in which we went from uh, Newton's law and we derived something equivalent down in there principle in order to get the virtual work in order to get rid of the force of constraints we considered virtual work and we went from there along a relatively uphill journey and finally derived this thing called the Granton equation And then time was up, and uh, we all got off the train, and um, it was kind of at a point at which we were wondering well, why did we do it. So from here, we're essentially going to take these equations and look at really what's nice about them, what's beautiful about them. We're going to explore this town quite thoroughly before moving on. When we do move on, it will be not too completely new territory, but it will be around the outskirts of town to some of the more scenic things that we, we didn't have time to have a look at in the early days. We'll look at um, certain nice properties of the ground equation. And once we've visited that part of town, we'll travel further down and have a look at perhaps how the Grunt equations are firing. Our forces conservative. are conservative. And when we're done with that, we'll perhaps travel around and look at how the Grunt equations are applied to the system. That's the program of the next week. After that, we might go out to some more exotic places. We may explore things like the calculus of variations. We may ask about how small oscillations are applied within the formalism. And those things will be perhaps further <coughs> outwards and closer to that large metropolis called modern physics. But for now, we'll leave ourselves in this part of town. And we'll get back to that story. What is the ground of the equation? And what does it mean? So, Let's write this down. We left on Monday with this rather enigmatic looking thing. QI plus LP QI is equal to DWT QI dot. And I said you should think about this side as momentum, derivative of momentum, and this side as force, F equals MA, either MD or MDT. Right, so that's the Graham's equation. There are a couple of things I just want to check about this equation. It was very nice, we've written some symbols before, but we should be able to verify that um, this does indeed correctly describe classical physics that somewhere along this route, we didn't get derailed. So, the first sanity check we should apply is to ensure that these rules, when we apply them, when our generalized coordinates are the coordinates of a particle in Cartesian space, that indeed we get back the classical law of physics. So, going to the equations 
are no different from Newton's equations physically. The content that they describe is exactly the same. All that we've done is we've taken Newton's equations, we've massaged them, we've changed them, we've put them in different slows. And what we've come up with is a new equation which will, will turn out to be a lot more general. But certainly describes the exact same physics as Newton's equation. So let's have a look at this in the case of um, in the case of a particle in free space. I'm going to delete our roadmap. So that's uh, put in the back down where I'm mine at all times. We're exploring the range equations. Um, so let's look at a particle in 2D Cartesian space. Such a particle is best described by its any, well, any coordinates you like, x and y. Right? x and y give the coordinates. I'm going to describe where that particle is. How many degrees of freedom does the system have? Okay, this particle is not a rigid object. It can't rotate or anything. It's just a particle. And it's living in a two-dimensional space. It has two degrees of freedom. Um, so the first thing we always ask when we solve problems with the Grange's equations, we'll get used to this algorithm as we go along. We always ask, how many degrees of freedom? The answer here is two. Right? Then we choose generalized coordinates. Well, for now, let's choose x and y, yeah. Right, so it's a particle. In other words, it's got no length, it's got no breadth. So if I draw a point, there's, there's no sense in talking about a particle rotating. It just moves from place to place. When we, when we idealize down to the particle, we have no intrinsic dimensions. That, that's what the definition of the particle is. No intrinsic dimensions. It cannot rotate. It can only move around the space. It's completely determined by where it is and how fast it's moving. Okay, so generalized coordinates. We're going to choose x and y. That fully describes the way the thing is. Remember, generalized coordinates are any coordinates that fully describe where our object is, in which there are no polynomial constraints relating it. We've got generalized coordinates. Once we're done with generalized coordinates, we generally ask the question, <coughs> in these generalized coordinates, what is the kinetic energy of the particle? So let's do kinetic energy. Remember, kinetic energy is equal to a half m v squared. Um, the velocity, if the position of the particle is x and y, then the velocity is x dot and y dot. So this is a half m the size of x dot and y dot squared. Right, I'm just taking the velocity vector and working out the length squared. And that one we know is a half m times x dot squared plus y dot squared. Right, so that's the kinetic energy in Cartesian coordinates. Um, once we're done with kinetic energy, all right, let's just see. Let's call this step forward. I'm going to step because it was so obvious in this case that it was almost not worth writing down, but I. Uh, I want to follow my algorithm. Once we've got the generalized coordinates, we always write down the transformation equations. Transformation equations should give us the Cartesian coordinates of every point in our system, every particle in our system, as a function of my generalized coordinates. So in this case, they're extremely obvious. And we'll see why. Transformation equations. Well, in this case, they look like x is equal to x and y is equal to y. There's no content. Um, but we always follow the algorithm. One, two, three, four. Let's do step five. So we work out the degrees of freedom, the generalized coordinates, the transformation equation, the kinetic energy. 
the next step, always, this is, we'll follow this, this procedure all the time. When you're doing a assignment, you will also follow this procedure when you're solving a problem. Um, the, the next step is working out the generalized components of force. Right, so remember that uh, the generalized components of force, I take the generalized coordinates, there will be two of them. Right? The x component, generalized component of force, will be the x tangent vector, ex dot the um, position, right? And this one will be E Y dot the force, right? But E X is just X hat and E Y is just Y hat. Everything is very easy in this case. You just get F X and F Y. So when we're doing everything in Cartesian coordinates, there's nothing funny going on. Um, and once we've got all of those things, we'll simply write down the greatest equations. So we've got two equations for our system because there are two degrees of freedom. You'll generally find when you do things like this, number of degrees of freedom will inform the number of generalized components of force, and it will also inform the number of Lagrange equations that we write down. So we write down Lagrange equations twice. The first one, do x plus del t by del x <coughs> is equal to d by dt del t by del x dot. The second one, 2y plus del t by del y is equal to d by dt of del t del y dot. The last step, we take those equations that we've written down and we simply substitute everything into them. As you can see, this is extremely algorithmic. And in fact, it is much easier than using Newton's law. Once we can remember this formula, we really just have to go through these steps and everything just <coughs> turn the handle and the machine spits out the answer. So let, let's see what happens. Um, we've, we've got this first one, well QX is just FX. So this looks like FX. Del T by del X. Let's have a look at my kinetic energy. There it is. Is there an X in here? Not an X dot, an X. There's no X, right? So del T by del X is zero. to the motion of that particle, 
we get right back to Newton's equation. All right, nothing fascinating. We just know at least that <coughs> what we've done, what we've derived, seems to make sense for a particle living in Newton's equation. Okay, well, generalized coordinates are, by virtue of their description, there are any coordinates that can completely describe the state of the particle, the position of the particle, the configuration of all particles in the system, <coughs> without, I don't know, any constraints between them. There's nothing special about using x and y. Let's change it. Let's use polar coordinates. Let's use r, theta. <coughs> A particle living in two-dimensional space can be completely described by the polar coordinates. How far is it from the origin? And what's its angle from the origin? Right, so it's use polar coordinates. When we use polar coordinates, we need to write down our translation equations. So we go through all the steps. Notice how we go through all the steps. What's x in terms of polar coordinates? And y? So we have our translation equations, and now we need to transform our kinetic energy. Well, I've already got it in terms of x and y. It's an x dot and y dot. So what I can do is, I can simply into this expression, and this is generally where we start. So I'm going to, in fact, erase all my working, and just start with the t equation. Uh -huh. And x dot squared plus y dot squared. <coughs> Now let's transform x dot squared plus y dot squared into polar coordinates. The first thing we should do is transform x dot. So I'm going to write working somewhere in the corner. We only have one board. So the first thing we do is we transform x dot. That's dx by dt. All I'm doing is taking the time derivative of x. So that's d by dt of r cos yeah. Which is, now remember, r and theta are both functions of time, so I must here you need to be correct. So this first component, r dot, times cos theta. That second component, I believe will be a minus, r theta dot, we use the chain rule, because I'm differentiating respect to time, not respect to theta, sine theta. Right, I can certainly work out the velocity in the y direction. y dot is equal to dy by dt is equal to d by dt of r sine theta. <coughs> and I uh, do the same trick again. Now, I'm different take <coughs> time. I use the product rule. So the first step will be r dot sine theta, and the second step will be r theta dot cos theta. <coughs> so now I square each of these and add them up. And you can do that on a page quickly. Um, I know the answer. It's pretty pointless for me to say I'm squaring them and then just write the answer down. We should try and work it out. Um, there is a trick that we'll learn later that will enable us to do this kind of thing much quicker. But uh, let's go through the steps for now. So if I square these terms and add them up, what do I get? Well, I could talk you through it. This first term squared plus this second term squared minus 2 times this term times this term. All right, that's the first one. The second one will be this squared plus this squared plus 2 times this one times this one. All right, but I'm adding them up, right? I'm adding them up. So I can add them in any order I like. So I'm going to add them this term squared plus this term squared. Well, that's r dot squared cos squared theta plus r dot squared sine squared theta, which is simply r dot squared. OK, you should check this on page, because I'm just going to kind of write down the number. A half m r dot squared. Now, if I add these two terms, I get r squared theta dot squared sine squared theta plus r squared theta dot squared cos squared theta, and that's simply r squared 
And the cross terms cancel. Then I ended up as a minus variant cross Right, so that's the kinetic energy and polar coordinates. There's a physical argument for this as well. Um, I'm, not, I'm not actually going to present the physical argument. Uh, I'll put this in notes. But you should think to yourself, well, how could I physically or genetically argue uh, that, um, that this is indeed the kinetic energy, that this is the velocity squared of the particle? Blindly just put a double dot on the theta like I did on the R. 
There are two things here that are time dependent. I will tell you right now that in more than half of the cases of people who failed this course last year, it was because they did not correctly do the time derivative in this step. And then they get all the following questions wrong. Do not try to take shortcuts here. Yeah. I, I mean, sure, once you get very used to doing this, you've done 10, 11 type problems, you start to think, oh, I can take the shortcut, I can just do the time derivative in one step. But in fact, when you're in exam conditions, which is quite a lot of pressure, you tend to make mistakes. It's better to write all the steps out, every part of the algorithm, every step of the way, um, and then you'll make fewer mistakes. So let's differentiate this and try and get it right. Well, what's this equal to? It's m. The first thing we'll do is differentiate the first term, right? So that gives us a 2. R, R dot, C dot. And uh, the second term, if we differentiate that, that's a theta double dot. So plus M, R squared, theta double dot. Right, so these equations are, in fact, Newton's laws in polar coordinates. They are the same equations we derived early in the course. Only early in the course, we had to do some reasonably annoying vector analysis in order to transform Newton's laws. Yeah, we simply took these equations and changed what we were doing them with respect to. So long as we had our transformation equations with the last month and any energy in the right place, everything worked. So you should be starting to see how yeah, this is really algorithmic. It's a stepwise procedure and that's the first kind of <coughs> advantage of the graph's equations is that now that we've gone through the effort, now that we've done the graph work, what we've got is something minus, something where we simply stumble along following these steps and we can solve our problems that, that, that we come across. So we've done some relatively trivial things, two different expressions for essentially the same thing, uh, Newton's laws in polar or Newton's laws in uh, Cartesian coordinates. All right. Nothing too surprising. Let's do another problem now. Now, we've all come to that. We've all seen the heat of the spinning hoop problem. Right? It's essentially a hoop. So, unfortunately, where does one draw? Uh, <laughs> So we've got a hoop. You've got to be the sliding around the hoop. You see there's no section. So the beat's allowed to fall down the hoop, it's allowed to oscillate, it's allowed to roll. It's, a, it's, a, it's not allowed to roll on its axis. It's kind of just a tube that is sliding like a particle along the hoop. And as we go the hoop is rotating with constant angular velocity like this, right through the board. So in this instance, and we've all we've all looked at the lab, we've all seen a, the blender file <coughs> in which the beat of the loop is represented, and I think that is the best way to visualize what's going on here. So what we're going to do in this, in this problem is we're going to try and derive equation of motion the same way that we have been doing. Alright, the first question I have, how many degrees of freedom? 